4.55, giving another minute for any stragglers to come in. Those of you watching on Twitch, hello. We'll be starting in a minute. While we're waiting, um, I'd like to do this every lecture. Um, think about what it is that you'd like to hear more about in today's lecture. Today's topic is algebraic data types, but um, uh, I have extra time, so, so I can do other things. Um, my default idea is to uh, walk through the homework um, in some detail with any time we have left. But uh, anything else, I'm more than happy to talk about. There's a question about uh, the late submission policy. Um, I'll just recap what the late submission policy is. You get three late days, no questions asked. So just um, submit it one day later. I don't know if I've set up Brightspace correctly to accept um, late admissions. Um, just let me know if it doesn't work uh, via email and I'll make sure it gets through. Oh, and I should um, start recording the Zoom meeting. No, I don't post the answers to the homework. However, if you are interested in seeing the answers, feel free to come to office hours where I will be more than happy to screen share the answers and um, uh, talk them over with you. Okay, it's 4.56, so let's go ahead and get started. So today, um, the topic, we're, we're still in live coding Haskell world. Um, we're going to get out of uh, the live coding soon uh, when we switch over to talking about the Lambda calculus. But there is um, one more important um, topic that I want to talk about. So just to recap what we've talked about so far, right? We've talked about, um, you know, how to do basic... Uh, to write programs in Haskell uh, using the built-in data types, especially lists, right? So um, the homework was due, but like, as I said, you do have a late day that you can use if you need to. And um, we, didn't, we didn't define any new data types. We use lists, we use integers, we use Booleans, all the stuff that I told you about. And of course, any self-respecting uh, programming language can't only be about, um, you know, the built-in data types, one of the things you're gonna very reasonably want to do is um, define your own data types and you know do operations on them. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how that works in Haskell because the way Haskell does this is a bit different than languages you might be used to, right? In, in, in particular, in conventional languages, um, the way of defining data types is I'm probably gonna be defining a class. And you know when we looked at JavaScript, um, well, there wasn't any concept of defining classes, but the workhorse of custom data types, IKA objects, you know, are basically all about classes. But Haskell does it a little differently, and there's some pretty neat stuff about how it does it. So let's just dive straight in to how it works. So we're going to start off by talking about how to define enums in Haskell because um, because they're a good segue into the more general concept namely algebraic data types. So like most other languages, um, we can define custom enumerations of various different um, uh, uh, possibilities in Haskell. So for example, let's suppose that I want to define a data type, uh, sorry, an enum um, defining you know, various types of uh, possible colors, um, primary colors, let's say, um, then I might try writing something like this. So let me just explain what this is doing. So what I'm doing is I'm defining a data type. Um, in fact, Haskell doesn't make a distinction between enumerations and other data types. So enums are just algebraic data types. Um, and I've named it primary color. And then I've said what the various enum options are. So red is an enum option, green is an enum option, and blue is an enum option. Um, there's a th few things I want to point out um, that might not be obvious here. So one is that um, uh, the primary color, this is naming a type, right? And in Haskell, conventionally, all types must be uppercase. So if you ever like tried to write a function like foobar equals two, you might have gotten um, Haskell telling you, no, 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 that's not okay. Um, 
you know, you can't, well, there's not in scope, no data constructor foobar. And in fact, um, uh, red, green, and blue, they are all data constructors and, um, you know, foobar is not one, so that doesn't work. Um, then uh, these enums, these are what we call data constructors. And somewhat confusingly, I suppose, they also have to be uppercase. And um, uh, so Haskell won't let you define something like this. It'll, it'll give you an error in that case. OK, um, so let's play around with this new type that we have. So uh, we might uh, want to create a value of a type primary color. And so we would simply define the data constructor in the same way we do here. But unfortunately, if I write this code just exactly as it is right now, um, Haskell will complain to me, uh, no instance for show primary color arising from use of print. And what this is basically saying is that, hey, I don't know how to turn uh, this enum into a string. Now, we could go ahead and write that by hand, but Haskell has a handy, Haskell has a handy um, feature called deriving, which lets us automatically um, derive um, this sort of thing. So what this basically says is define this data type, and by the way, also um, you know generate a bunch of code, boilerplate code basically, saying how to print out um, things that are blue. So now if I say blue, it'll tell me you know hey I have a blue thing, and if I ask what the type of blue is, uh, then you know hey uh, blue is a primary color, just exactly as I'd like to do it. Okay, so so we've got our enums. Let's talk a little bit about what we can do with them, right? So I've shown you how to print them. Um, I've shown you how to create values, which are like the enums. So if I say x equals blue, then I have a new variable that you know is x, which is a primary color, and when I print it, it's blue. Um, but you know, to do to actually use an enum, I need to be able to like switch on it, right? I need to um, discriminate between the various values. And in fact, we already know how to do this. It's pattern matching again. So let's say that I want to write a um, function. Um, it's not very well defined, but let's call it swizzle. And all it does is it maps a primary color to some other primary color. We're just going to like swap the colors one by one. So um, normally, if I write this function, you know, I'm like, well, I take a primary color as an argument, and I get, need, need to give something else. And pattern matching says, well, I can actually just literally write write uh, the constructor here and then say what I want it to be. Let's say we're going to map red to blue, blue to green, and um, green to red. And so now I have a function, swizzle, which when I run it on red, gives me blue. And if you don't think too hard about, like, you know, pattern matching and programming, right? Like this seems very, you know, clear and intuitive, right? I'm just saying swizzle of red is blue. And so when I swizzle red, it's blue. One other thing I want to point out is um, this sort of is the reason why um, Haskell forces data constructors to have cap uh, to be capitalized. It helps you distinguish if you're binding something to a variable versus if you're pattern matching on, an, on a data constructor, right? So when I see swizzle red, where red is capitalized, I know, please match against the red data constructor. But if I wrote swizzle red underscore uh, non-capitalized, well, that doesn't refer to the, um, the data constructor. In fact, it just says, take any primary color, call it red, confusingly, and then map it to blue. So if I you know, try to run uh, this here, well, indeed, red would map to blue but so would blue and so would green. In fact, Haskell has very nicely told us that something is afoot because it is saying to me, hey, um, you know, because you've written this pattern match that matches any primary color because you just said bind it to some name, uh, this, this pattern match will never get called because if you give a blue, I'll just use this pattern match and I'll say the pattern match is redundant. Um, by the way, I don't know if I said this in the last lecture, but the pattern matches always go in order. So we first try to match on the first line, then the next line, and so forth and so forth. Okay, um, what are your questions so far? Also, I'm going to repeat again, which is that I want you to think about um, what you found confusing about the homework, or perhaps um, I noticed a few students still haven't submitted. If you haven't submitted yet, what you would really like to know that would help you out a lot in working on the homework. And please 
type in the chat um, and let me know and I will try to work them into today's lecture. So please, 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 right? These are live for a reason. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's cool for um, uh, doing enums, but if Haskell only let us define enum enumerations, it, that wouldn't be very interesting. And indeed, um, the idea, the fact that I call these algebraic data types, um, well, forget about the algebraic for now, but I call them data types, suggests they can be so much more than just um, enumerations. And so let's look at another problem that we saw um, earlier. So earlier I, I mentioned to everyone that um, lists in Haskell are homogenous. What do I mean by homogenous? That means that you can't put uh, multiple different types of things inside a list. But let's say you know you are trying to maybe model JSON and you are saying, hey, uh, I, I want to you know actually represent these different kinds of lists because they're valid in JSON. Am I totally out of luck in Haskell? Is there no way to do this? And the answer is no, there is a way to do this. And um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to um, define an algebraic type, but it's not just going to be an enumeration. In fact, the enumeration uh, branches will support extra data. So um, let me just re-indent primary color in a way that's very common for people. Um, this is exactly the same thing, but people often like to write things in this way because it makes each of the cases clearer. And then I'm going to write, um, I'm going to write uh, JSON in the same way. So I, I, I want to be able to do the various data types in JSON. So you know what have we got? Well, we've got JSON integers. Um, let's do camel case. JSON integers. We've got JSON strings. And you know, let's just say we've got JSON booleans. And this too is a valid Haskell type. And let's think a little bit about what this means. So like in the enumeration case, I have a number of different possibilities. Um, instead of red, green, blue, they're JSON, int, string, and bool. But unlike the enumeration, I've added an extra field um, to each of them. So uh, JSON int is not simply just a single enum that doesn't say anything else, but it also comes with some extra data, namely an integer. Similarly, JSON string isn't just a label saying this is a string, but it also comes with a string saying what the string in question is, and so forth and so forth. So this um, will type check, and you might be wondering, okay, uh, how do I create values in this way, right? So when I did um, primary colors, I just called the data constructors. So do I just call uh, the JSON int? Uh, well, um, you know, we're going to get this. A obscure message about how there's no instance for show into JSON. Hopefully by now you know what's going on, right? JSON int isn't just a data value, it's a function. It's a function that takes an integer and produces a JSON value. And in fact, so if we want to create one of these JSON ints, we have to in fact pass it an integer. And it prints out exactly the same way because it's just data, right? It's just a JSON int constructor coming along with an integer. And if I ask what the type of that is, well, it's just a JSON as expected. And we can do the same thing with string, and we can do the same thing with bool. And uh, now we want to look at, you know, how do we how do we get data out of um, JSON? And the answer is, once again, pattern matching. So let's write a pattern match. Um, uh, so we're, let's write a custom show function. So I mentioned that um, um, deriving show automatically generates a show, but as you can see, it gives you this JSON int thing, and you know maybe we're like, hey, I don't really want to have to um, write. I don't really want to have to write uh, the JSON int tag because like when I'm looking at actual JSON, you know, I just see a three, right? I, I can understand it from context. So let's go ahead and write that. I see a question in the chat asking if we can do recursive data types. We can, um, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself if I do that right now. So let's 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 um, say uh, print JSON is our function, right? So what it's going to do is going to get take a JSON and um, give us a string. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, you know, when we pattern matched against the enums, we just wrote in the data constructor, and then that was it. Now, when we're pattern matching against an actual data type, we want to also, you know, somehow get our hands on the uh, value in question. And so the way we're going to do that 
is we're going to write the the same way we would have written the value and instead of writing you know an actual integer we're going to just write a variable that's what we're going to bind to it and then i'm just going to use the magic function show which you know knows how to turn integers into strings and we're going to do this again for all the other things by the way the parentheses are required if you forget the parentheses you'll get an obscure error saying i don't know let's see whatever it gives in this case it tells me that uh, the equations have different number of arguments, right? Because, because if you write this, you're saying print JSON takes two arguments. One is a JSON string and the other is an X. So you, you have to remember the parentheses. And so what's going on here is I have um, pattern matched over each possible data constructor for, um, for the JSON in question and I furthermore am able to bind the field in the JSON to a variable, which I can then use to um, I can then use to actually print here. And so there was a very nice question asking, can I do things recursively? And the answer is yes, and it works in exactly the way we expect. So let's uh, add lists to our JSON data type. And you know how I'm going to do that? Well, a JSON list should simply be a list of JSON values. And if I want to go ahead and say how to print that. Well, um, it's a little tricky, but um, the way we're going to do this is we are going to, uh, you know, we need to print the brackets and there's a function called intercalate that I can use to insert commas over. And then remember map, map says run this function on every, um, every uh, value inside my uh, list. So. So here, here's an implementation of printing lists that works. So what it, what it says is print a give me give me a string that is you know a open bracket, and then um, after having you know printed each individual element recursively into a string, join them together with commas. And let's let's see if I wrote this right. Um, oh, intercalate is in data dot list. So let's go ahead and import that. And so now if I print JSON, JSON list, which has our original example, right? With a string and a bool. And indeed we get something very reasonable. Um, this, is, this, is an, this is quoted because what happened was it returned a string. So um, Haskell won't unquote a string by default. So let's just back up a moment. So what have we got so far, right? So um, we've got this concept of algebraic data type in Haskell and um, the way it works, right, is we define as many um, variations as we want. We can put as many fields as we want. So in this example, I only ever gave a single field, but we can have multiple fields. Like say we wanted a JSON object. Um, a JSON object is a little tricky to do. Um, we need, you know, some, keys and then we need some values and one possible representation for it is we could have a list of keys and a list of values associated with those keys in the same order and this works exactly fine and um, when i want to write print json for this um, i simply just bind two uh, variables for it right one for the keys and one for the values and i will leave um, the actual implementation of this to um, you know the reader's own exercise Okay, so this idea of enumerations that uh, have extra um, values associated with them, we can think of this as sort of the like big idea about how to define things in Haskell. And it actually goes really, really far. And so I wanna look at a bunch of examples where um, uh, this actually is really, really helpful. So let's um, take, for example, um, an ex uh, a, a thing that you might've noticed um, when you were playing around with some of the basic library functions on lists. So um, you're always, you're supposed to do pattern matching, but I've seen some, uh, I've seen a lot of student homeworks where people are like, oh, um, if the list isn't empty, then I'm gonna call head to get out the first element of the list, and I'm gonna call tail to get out the rest of the list. 
And head and tail are not very good functions. And the reason they're not very good functions are because they are partial functions. They don't actually work in all situations. In particular, if you call head on an empty list, you'll get a exception. Um, Haskell does has, have exceptions, but they're kind of weird. And in particular, um, with all the tools that I've told you about so far in sort of the pure uh, no input output, no side effects universe, there is no way to actually recover from an exception. The exception is basically a panic. It's like, I, I, there's nothing I can do, sorry. So head and tail are partial functions. They don't work on all inputs. And if you get one of these situations, um, you're, you're done for, you can't do any of it. Um, there's a question which is, is there no try and catch in Haskell? And the answer is, there is a try and catch in Haskell. But, and this is uh, a prelude to the upcoming Monad lecture, you can't actually do try and catch inside pure code. You have to do it inside the so-called IO Monad. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what an IO Monad is shortly. But right now we can't do this. And so this is, a, surely this is a big problem, right? Because like in a lot of reasonable programs we want to write, we want to like have an error, but then recover from that error at some later point in time. And so in Haskell, we can solve this problem by, well, what do you think? Creating an algebraic data type. So let's make an algebraic data type that can um, deal with this situation. Let's call it failable int. So our idea is we're gonna write a new function. I'm not gonna fill this in for now, but I wanna write a new function safe head. And it's gonna take a list of integers, but instead of you know just always claiming I can always return a um, integer in this case, I wanna say, well, um, maybe I will give you an integer, but maybe there's no integer because the list was empty. And so failable int is going to represent the situation. So we can think a little bit about how we might go about implementing this. Um, and um, does anyone want to shout out how, how you might put something like this together? So I basically want to um, say there's no integer in one case. And in the other case, I want to say there is an integer and here's what it is. We've got all the tools to do this. Okay, so someone suggests let's have uh, two cases, error, and another case, result. Sounds great to me. And so let's go ahead and implement this function. So save head. So I'm going to go ahead and do this um, the same way. So if I call save head on an empty list, well, there's no, um, there's, there's no head, so I'm just going to return an error in that case. Um, but if there is, uh, it's, there is an element on the list, then I'm just going to go ahead and return that element. This doesn't type check. Can someone tell me why this doesn't type check? Yes, so um, the student said, we're not returning a failable int, we're just returning a straight int. We have to turn the int into a failable int by wrapping it with the result in question. We go ahead and do that, and hey, we've got a safe head. When we call it on an empty list, oh, oops, forgot to derive show on this data type. And so if I run safe head on an empty list, hey, I get an error. And if I run safe head on a um, actual list, then um, I, I get that element. That's pretty cool. And what that means is now, if I want to recover from this failure, um, there's a very simple way I can do it, which is I can just pattern match on the result in question. So let's, um, let's imagine that I wanna write a zero head function that takes a int and always returns an int, but it returns a zero when the function in question is empty. And this time I'm not going to pattern match, right? I want to use safe head to do this. So safe head gives me either an error or a result. So I'm just going to go ahead and pattern match on it. Now, um, I'm pattern matching on the result of a function, right? So do we remember how to do a pattern match in this case? Uh, we don't have, we're, we're not writing a function, so I can't just go ahead and um, type in the cases here. So instead I'm going to use the case statement in Haskell, right? So I'm going to say um, case over all the possibilities um, for safe head x's, i.e. there's an error case and there's an int case. And so what did I say I wanted to do in this case? Well, in the error case, I wanted to return zero, and in the result case, I wanted to return x. Or, you know, I, I could have made this more complicated and done more interesting things in this situation. And we can see this function works.
Um, there's a question, which is how would I make this work for more than just int? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I'll be more than happy to tell you how this um, happens. So remember in um, our previous class, um, we talked about how to generalize head so that it worked uh, well. Um, we, we, were, we were talking about a bunch of functions, right? So head is an example function. And I was like, well, you know, head int is like this. But if you want to generalize it, then you can uh, replace the int with a type variable. And that type variable says, hey, this function works for any type A, not just an integer. Can we do something similar for um, uh, zero head? Well, uh, let, let's just look at safe head for a moment. Can we do something similar for safe head? Well, we can try to pull the same trick, but there's a problem, which is that I've uh, I've named my you know data type failable int, and clearly, if I get a list of like booleans, I can't give you an integer in the success case. So something has to change in the data declaration as well. And so interestingly, uh, Haskell data types also support what we call type parameters. What's a type parameter? Well, you can think of it as saying, um, "Hey, I've got this type, and um, uh, it's not an actual type. You have to give me some other type." and uh, then you will get a type in this situation. It's like a function parameter, but instead of taking values, it takes types. And so what I'm gonna do is I, you know, instead of saying failable int, I'm gonna take in what the type of the thing that I'm gonna return as a result in a situation. There's a question, which is, is this like generics? And the answer is yes, this is exactly generics. And so now I have a generic failable that will work on any type. And so instead of saying that this is going to return a failable int, I'm just going to say that it will return a failable a, where a is whatever it was that you passed me in the input list. And now we have a safe head that type checks. And if I pass in a list of Booleans, it still works in the situation. So let's just summarize for a moment. Um, so we've defined this very useful type. Um, and um, in fact, in the Haskell standard library, there's already a name for this type called maybe. And um, it's defined to be either nothing or just A. So you, so you don't have to define this type on your own. You can just use um, the built-in maybe um, for this um, situation. Um, let's look at another type. So we did a bunch of stuff with lists, right? And lists seem kind of magical because they had special syntax, right? Um, uh, the open bracket square bracket was the empty list, and the um, colon was the um, you know uh, cons operator add to the beginning of list. But in fact, we can define lists ourselves um, without um, having to you know. Lists can be defined directly in the language. Um, there's nothing special about them. So let's try doing that. So like um, failable, um, I want lists to have a type parameter because I don't want only to be able to write um, int lists or you know string lists. I want to have a list that can have anything in it. And um, you know, well, what's a list? So a list is either empty, let's call that nil, or it is um, a you know element appended onto another list. So it's a cons of some element and the rest of the list. And hey, we have our own home cooked list uh, data type, and in fact, it is uh, it is it is basically equivalent to the um, built-in um, list type, except that well, the built-in list type has fancy syntax, right, to make this shorter. But it, but it's exactly the same thing. So you know, we can write safe uh, our head list a to failable a, and It'll, it'll work exactly the same way we expect, right? So instead of patching, pattern matching on an open bracket, close bracket, we pattern match on nil. And um, instead of pattern matching on a colon, we just pattern match on uh, cons x x's. No, I'm not going to run that um, to do that. What are your questions so far?
Um, so someone um, is asking, can we uh, talk about this line? And um, yeah, it, it is a bit of a, um, a chunky line. So, okay, this is a good segue into just saying what the rules for algebraic types are. So whenever I define, in general, whenever I define an algebraic data type, I say data alg data type, where this is some type name, and then uh, let me forget about type parameters for a moment. I can have any number of constructors, and each of these constructors can have any number of fields specified by types. And um, that, that, that's, that's basically it. That, that's all you can do with algebraic data types. Um, actually, there's um, this thing called record syntax, but um, I'm not gonna tell you about that. You can go look it up uh, online if you're interested. So with this in mind, um, what is this cons line? So um, each of the types is separated by spaces. So if you have a like non-trivial type like list A, you put it in parentheses. So what we see is that there are two types here. And that means that cons has two fields. The first field takes an A, yeah, so the, the generalized version, right, is um, is you can also have any number of type variables uh, inside the front of your algebraic data type, which gives you, um, you know, which you can refer to inside the types in question. So there's two fields, one is A and the other is list A. There's another question in chat, which is what does deriving mean? Um, well, uh, deriving is a, um, it's a basic, um, what I would call metaprogramming facility where instead of having to write a program from scratch, um, you can ask the compiler to automatically derive it for you. So um, deriving show means, hey, compiler, you're smart, figure out how to turn these um, data types into strings for me so that I don't have to write it um, myself. Because remember, when we when we tried to um, print um, various data types that um, uh, in GHCI and we didn't derive show, um, GHCI told us, no, I don't know how to do this. And actually, it kind of does know how to do it. But you have to explicitly ask the compiler to use this information. Did that answer the question about deriving? Um, this is also a good opportunity to just um, emphasize um, pattern matching in general. So when we you know, do pattern matching in general, um, we always have, uh, let me add a constructor that doesn't have any arguments. Um, we always uh, need to go uh, handle every single case inside of our algebraic data type. So whenever there are fields, um, we have to add parentheses and we have to write variables, one for every field that is there. So const two. Um, the only exception for the parentheses is, are when there are no fields, in which case you are allowed to omit the parentheses in this case. There's a question, which is, is there a decently easy way to define lists of varying types of unknown length, or is this purposely not possible or difficult? Um, and uh, the answer is um, you basically have to do something like JSON. If you're okay with there being a fixed set of possible elements you can put in your list, or if you want to um, uh, have it be any type, there's another concept in Haskell called dynamic, um, which can let you do that. But yes, I would say that Haskell does make this intentionally difficult because most of the time you don't actually need to record arbitrary um, like different types inside a list. There's a very fixed set of things that you can possibly expect in that situation. And so the Haskell way is you just say exactly what can actually occur in your data type declaration and then um, just pattern match on that. Um, there's another uh, tag word tagline that uh, Ron Minsky likes to say, which is make illegal states unrepresentable. When you have a um, list in a conventional language, uh, uh, sorry, a conventional dynamically typed language, that list can contain anything. And you know, most of the time when you write a program, you're not going to be able to deal with most things. You're only going to be able to deal with some you know narrow subset of the universe that works. And so any list that contains random crap that doesn't 
you know, uh, fit your program's preconditions is just going to cause your program to fail. That's not very good. So the idea behind Haskell is that it's very cheap. It's very easy. Notice how few lines of code I have to write to define, you know, a list or, um, you know, a JSON data type. It really isn't very many lines of code. So you can just define a data type when you need to, to say exactly what it is that you can pass into your function. And now you have a much tighter program for which it is impossible because the type checker doesn't let you do it. It is impossible to pass in uh, inputs that don't satisfy the input preconditions. That's a really powerful technique and it's worth applying in as many settings as you can, even outside of Haskell. Other questions? Okay, so um, I've got um, I've got two more examples, then I want to talk a little bit about quick check because um, that will figure into homework two, which by the way is out and you can get started on. Homework two is um, implementing a calculator. So we're going to have a data type representing mathematical expressions and then we're going to go and you know do some stuff with them. Um, so uh, the first example that I want to give is a precursor uh, to the monads lecture. And um, uh, what I want to do is I want to write a function called um, find, which takes a list of integers and uh, two predicates. And returns an integer that satisfies those predicates, um, both of them, or, uh, or it um, either uh, if um, if the integer doesn't satisfy both those predicates, then we don't do it. Um, actually, uh, no, I don't. I don't want to do it exactly this way. Um, let's let's do it as. Um, hmm. This example is a little a little not quite right. Okay, I'm not gonna do it this way. We'll do another example. Let's do some trees. Okay, so um, in the case of lists and in the case of JSON, we had these examples where we made recursive references to um, data types. And so binary trees are another fun example which um, work for this sort of situation. So, um, Here's a very simple implementation of a binary tree, a, a so-called leafy binary tree. Um, what is a tree? Well, either it's a leaf where I've stored some integer. Otherwise, it is a node which has two fields, um, a left subtree and a right subtree. Um, why is it? Oh, it's because I didn't set ET. OK, there we go. So, so non-leaf nodes have no data associated with them. By the way, if you wanted to associate data with them, you could add an extra field um, with whatever data you wanted. So, you know, once again, it's really easy to just define the data type you want. Um, and um, there's various things we might want to do with these. Um, for example, uh, let's say that we wanted to sum all the elements inside the tree. Well, we can write a very nice and simple recursive function here. Um, there's a question which is why do we need brackets on the show and the answer is we actually don't need them um, but uh, yeah we, we don't need them that error is unrelated um, but I, I always reflexively put parentheses around my deriving because actually um, there are a bunch of other things you can derive for example um, you might want to be able to test if two trees are equal that's another type of boilerplate code that you can um, have the compiler automatically generate for you. And if you're going to do multiple things, then you have to write it in this way. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's why I always parent, uh, parenthesize. So let's write this sum tree function. So um, how do I write a function like this? Well, once again, I'm going to do it recursively. So I'm going to pattern match over each of the possibilities and just figure out what I'm going to do in each case. 
So if I have a leaf node, well, um, the sum of a you know single node tree with only one element in it is exactly what that element is. And if I have a node, well, I want to sum up what the left subtree's values are. I want to sum up what the right subtree's values are, and I want to add them together. So here I have a sum tree, and I can run it on a little example. Notice the parentheses I'm adding because um, you know I need to make sure that node takes two arguments, one of them being a leaf two, and the other one being another node, which itself consists of a leaf three and a leaf four. And we can see I've added them all together. Now, I might have other things that I might want to do over the tree, right? Like uh, and when I, um, I could also have a product tree, right? In fact, this should remind you quite a bit of the situation with um, lists where, you know, even when we were talking about sum and product, we had a way to generalize it into a single function that worked in all those cases. And in fact, we can do the same thing with trees as well. So what do you need to do? Well, we need to have some sort of way of converting, uh, generalizing over the binary operation that we want to do here. And what's that going to be? Well, that's just a higher order function that let, let's say that our function is only going to work on integers um, that takes two integers and produces an integer. And then we take a tree and finally produce an integer. And we can indeed generalize in this way. Where I'm going to recursively fold tree on the left subtree and fold tree on the right subtree and then use my combining function to combine the results together. And now I have a generic fold tree that I can use to implement some tree. Oops. Remember when I have a operator, I can put parentheses around it so I can treat it as a normal, normal function. And I can also get out product tree in this way as well by just replacing the plus with a multiply. So you know all the all the tricks we learned about lists, right? They apply to all the all the data types that we might be interested in. What are your questions? Uh, question is: um, Is it possible to change the show or eek of any data type? And the answer is yes. So for example, if you didn't want to um, derive show. Um, we could do it by hand. Um, but I'm going to tell you how to do that in more detail um, when we talk about type classes. But it looks something like this. And then you define show. And it would be yet another function that you would write here. Um, Oh, some other useful things, which is that um, there, there are some other things that um, you can do in pattern matching that can be helpful. I'm just going to tell you about them. So um, when you have a lot of cases like this, sometimes you, you know, there are only a few cases you're interested in. And then everything else, you're like, well, I, I don't really care, um, whatever, right? And we already saw that you know, when we bind something to a variable, um, that actually matches everything. And so if you actually just don't care about what is inside, you can use an underscore. Just, just say, uh, don't care, match everything. There's also another thing you can do, which is that um, um, you can match against a constructor and at the same time bind the constructor to some variable. And that's using this so-called at syntax. So um, why would this be useful? Well, there's a few situations this would be useful. So um, let's just um, talk about what p is, right? So uh, if I call foo on constructor one uh, true uh, blah, then x will be mapped to true, y will be mapped to blah, but p will be mapped to the entire constructor in question. And um, in this situation, um, you know, certainly uh, you might want to say print p, or you might need to pass it on to some other function that um, you know takes uh, 
takes you know the alge data type, not the intermediate types, and then being able to refer to p in a short way is useful in this situation. So that's that's one of the cases. Like so, if you're like trying to debug, right, and you want to print out you know exactly what the constructor was, um, that might also be a situation you use this in. There's a question um, which is how difficult would it, a doubly linked list be to um, represent? Um, and the answer is, well, uh, pretty difficult. Um, it's actually possible, um, but we'd have to get um, more into laziness um, to see how you would go about doing it. And there would still be a very big problem, which is you actually would not be ever able to edit the list in question. But it actually is possible. Um, but like, um, If if you were trying to like do this naively, you might do something like you know head, which no points to some doubly linked list, and then um, you know you have a well, really you just have a node, right? And you want to know what is um, in the front of the node, and what is at the end of the node, as well as you know what is stored here. And basically, what you'll notice is that. Um, Haskell is more than happy to accept, let's call it n. Haskell is more than happy to accept this data declaration, but how exactly are you going to go about actually defining even a, um, oh, well, uh, I guess technically the pointers can be empty, right? So we have to maybe them. The problem is, hey, how exactly am I going to construct a list that looks like this, right? Because I need to somehow be like, well, n is, um, you know, the head of the list, and so there's nothing in front of it, and let's put a one here, and then this is the next element of the list, and it contains two, and let's say that's the end of the list, but then somehow I need to set up this back pointer, but it needs to point to the front of the list, but like, how do I even do that? And it turns out you can do this. And um, Haskell will say, yeah, I'll take that. Will it take that? Oh, well, I have to, I have to actually um, make this adjust. And this guy also has to be adjust. And um, Haskell accepted this program should should make you look pretty funnily at it because I'm defining something, I'm assigning it to a variable x, but while I'm defining the thing in question, I made use of the variable x directly. Ooh, what's going on here? And the answer is, well, Haskell is lazily executed, so this is okay because we don't ever try to use x to compute this value in question. But if we actually try to use it, well, something very intriguing would happen. Let's take a look at what x is. All right, that's enough of that. Um, we'll look in more detail with what is going on with these sort of like infinite structures uh, when we talk about laziness um, halfway through the semester. Okay, let me see if I have gotten through everything that I want to do. Oh yes, I promised some quick check. Let's talk about quick check. So something you might have been, oh dear. Okay, I need to install quick check. Sorry, this is my bad. I should have set this up beforehand. Uh... Quick check is very popular. There are a lot of other languages that have gotten copies of it. Um... Okay, I want libgc. Sorry. Another one with GC with Haskell.
Okay, pray this works. Otherwise, I'll have to do this another day. Here we go. Okay, so some of you working on homework, uh, on the first homework, um, may have been wondering, how exactly do we write tests in Haskell? And um, uh, uh, if you look online, you can find um, there are a number of unit testing Haskell frameworks. Um, you can read their docs and maybe puzzle out what they're doing. Um, and uh, I could tell you about that, but I'm not interested in just telling you about normal things. So what I want to tell you about is a very interesting um, testing framework in Haskell called QuickCheck, which um, goes about um, testing in a kind of unusual way. So um, I want to go back to our reverse example. So we wrote a function reverse, um, which reversed the list. And we're interested in, you know, like, how do we check that this function is correct? And obviously, um, one thing we could do is we could, you know, um, type some manual test cases. Typing manual test cases is great. I highly recommend doing it. But there's also something else really interesting we can do in the case of reverse, which is we can come up with properties that the function um, should uh, work on with any sort of input and then um, say, oh, well, these properties should be true. So for example, um, with the reverse function, it should always be the case that if I reverse a, f uh, if I reverse a list twice, the result is equal to the original. So let's step through this function moment. So we know exactly what this function does because um, I haven't used anything we haven't talked about in this class before. So this is a function that takes in a list of integers and produces a Boolean. And what does it do? Well, it reverses that list of integers and then reverses that result again and then tests that this is equal to x. Oh, I didn't tell you how to do equality, but it's done with equals equals. Um, not equals is um, done a bit unconventionally using a slash rather than an exclamation mark. So this is a function, and if I were to um, call this function with some test input, um, it would tell me whether or not this property was upheld. So if I test on one, two, three, it works. If I test on one, three, it works. Um, empty list, um, that also works. And um, so what I've got here is I don't actually have to write any test cases, right? Any valid list of integers is a valid test case for this property in question. So what QuickCheck does, is we can use it to directly test this property without actually having to write any um, write any test cases ourselves. So I quick check prop rev and quick check says, okay, pass 100 tests. So what exactly happened when I typed this? What happened was quick check looked at the type signature in question, list of integers. It said, I know how to generate random inputs that are lists of integers. It generated a whole bunch of them, 100 to be exact. And then it checked that um, you know, it actually uh, worked. And um, indeed, this property was true for all those cases. And um, you know, we're happy. But let's say that we break this um, example and like we do something that's obviously false. We try again. And quick check is like, yo, this is no good. Um, I was able to falsify this property. Um, I don't know why it, um, oh, it, 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 it also does this thing called shrinking where um, it might have started off with some sort of really random, very um, uh, large test input, but it'll try to shrink it into a very small test case. And we see indeed that the list zero one uh, is, um, well, when you reverse it, it's not equal to itself. And QuickCheck found that automatically without having to, you know, when, when you're writing unit tests, one of the problems with writing unit tests is you have to imagine up the failure case, right? But QuickCheck will just generate the random input for you. It's it's a lot like fuzzing and um, figure it out there. Um, there's another uh, fun series of examples which I want to do that um, is from Matt Might, and it's um, we can do a little bit of number theory using QuickCheck. So, um, for example, um, um, we know that uh, whenever you have an even number then if you add one to it, it's odd. Um, this colon, colon, uh, sorry, equals equals arrow is a, sort, a form of logical implication. It says, if this is true, then this is true. Um, and um, that's also very useful because sometimes, you know, like not all inputs will satisfy the property. So you want a condition on this. And we can ask, hey, you know, is this actually true? And it says, yeah, um, it is. Although, um, you know, 95 of the input cases I tested 
um, didn't work. I, I, um, they didn't pass the preconditioning question. Um, so uh, let's just um, define a little helper function. So um, m divides n if when I take n modulo m, um, that's zero. So now we can basically test if um, something is prime. So how are we going to test if something is prime? Well, if the number is one or less, it's not prime. If the number is two, that's prime. And if um, I've got some bigger number, uh, there are a bunch of ways you can do this, but we'll do a very crappy, um, we'll do a very crappy uh, division test, which is we'll just test that um, as long as any number between two and one less than that number divides into that number, then uh, uh, then it's not prime. This is a very crappy implementation. Like one very simple improvement is instead of iterating up to n minus one, you only need to go to the square root. And furthermore, you know you can do a sieve type thing. But but this is like very simple. Oh, by the way, you don't actually need this lambda here. You can use this thing called operator sections, where you just like omit the left hand side, and that implicitly gives you a lambda. That's like that. Let me just show you this works. So three, four, five, six, and so forth. And so there's a very famous conjecture in number theory, which is that um, if I have a prime number, then the Mersenne prime for it is uh, also prime. Um, question from, Al uh, uh, which is, um, how is this divides n operation different from currying? And the answer is it's no different at all. But you might like to use this because if you had um, you had just done divides n, n would be the first argument to the function in question. But by um, making this uh, operator section, um, n is I'm making n the actual second argument, and the thing we're waiting to pass in is the first argument. And so we can check if this is um, true or not. And in fact, the answer is it's not true. And Quick Check figured out the counterexample, which a bunch of mathematicians way back in the day had to manually figure out. Yeah, so, so the backticks make divides infix. And then when I put n on the right-hand side of the infix operator, I'm saying that's the second argument. And then so when I omit the second argument, then uh, I don't uh, have the first argument. Um, it's it's very similar to like when I say plus n, that's an, uh, well, plus is commutative, so this is a bad example. But if I say like uh, minus is weird, um, if I say slash n, that says, you know, divide this by n, right? It's a function that takes the input and divides it by n. So quick check can find the counterexample that shows that um, the Mersenne prime of a prime number is not necessarily prime. And of course, we can you know do something super goofy like we can ask Haskell whether or not the Collatz conjecture is true. Collatz conjecture is this funny function which is like you know uh, if um, if you've got some number n, well compute some function on it where you know if n is even, then divide it by two. Otherwise. If it's odd, multiply it by three and add one to it. And then Collatz conjecture is that, you know, no matter how many times you do this, eventually you get to one and then you'll be done. And we can ask quick check, you know, can you disprove the Collatz conjecture? And uh, did I write this right? Um, FN. Hmm. It's not terminating. Well, it looks like it can't disprove the Collatz conjecture. That's too bad. <laughs> so quick check's really cool. And um, in the uh, homework two, which is due on Monday next week, Monday, not Wednesday, Wednesday was the extension, on Monday, um, you'll be writing a bunch of uh, things involving a calculator. 
and then you will um, use quick check to test some things about your function. So that's pretty cool and um, look forward to it. Any more questions? Okay, I'm gonna ask a more direct question, which is um, folks on the homework, what do you wanna see about the homework? Um, we can do the calculator homework too, if you want, although um, I'll have to like explain it and it probably will run out of time before we get to anything juicy. I, I meant more um, homework one. Oh yes, exactly. Um, maybe maybe I uh, have a problem with my arbitrary precision integers or something like that. Uh, the, the comment in um, chat was, um, it collapse must not have terminated because, well, <laughs> Um, it found a counterexample. I don't see any requests for things on basic. Um, well, if there aren't any requests, I'm not sure I want to do things on it. Let me check my notes for other fun stuff to tell you guys about then. Okay, so so we're in we're in bonus hour now. Um, I think I've told everything that I wanted to go over in this class. Um, once again, if you have questions, please, please, please say them. Um, okay, here's a question. Am I using Emacs or Vim for Haskell? I'm using Vim, but that's just because I'm a diehard Vim user. I, I use Vim for everything. Um, I saw some people using VS Code for Haskell. VS Code is cool. If you can get it to work, highly recommended. Um, I actually have used Emacs in the past um, because uh, um, when I do, do theorem proving, which is basically functional programming on steroids, um, the, the, the front end for uh, COQ is in, is, in, is in Emacs. So I have to use Emacs. So I know a little bit of Emacs, but I usually prefer using Vim. Um, there's another question, which is how is my Vim colorful? Well, this is just, this is the default configuration on my Ubuntu VM. I, I literally didn't configure it at all. That, that, by the way, that's why I keep having to like set all these things because by default Vim uses tabs and it's terrible. <laughs> um, let me see, what else do I want to tell people about? Um, there's a question about if then else. That's very much fair game. Let's talk about if then else. Um, so, okay. Um, so someone wanted to use if then else in the homework. Um, do you know which uh, problem you were trying to use it on? Uh, this is a good. This is a good way to for me to like actually do something on the homework. Which 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 function? The last question in the first part. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna pop open the model solution for this homework. And we'll go ahead and delete this. And let's try implementing it. So there's a bunch of things we wanna do. And um, we it'll be best to look at the specification, right? So what we want to do is we want to add all the digits in the odd number positions, and then multiply it by three. Well, first we want to first we want to like turn the input into digits. So um, okay, so here's a case where it's it's helpful to know that Haskell is lazy. So what we can do is we can actually like just define a where clause and put all the things that we want to do in the where clause, regardless of whether or not it's okay to do them or not. So for example, if I is not a well-formed UPC code, for example, it is um, uh, one of the functions we wrote is um, if, you know, well, I is negative, 
then you know I, I can use a guard to test this case. Okay, actually, so so one one question is okay. So I need to not call two digits if my integer is negative because probably your implementation of two digits digits doesn't work in that case. Um, and there's a few ways we can go about doing that. The way I would prefer to do that is I would say if i is less than zero in a guard, then this is not a valid UPC code. Otherwise, I'm going to write the rest of my logic here. Um, but you can also do an if then else statement. I I don't prefer it because. Um, because, well, one is that um, it's, you know, kind of longer. And two is that, you know, whenever you're doing an if then else statement and then returning true or false, that usually should suggest that you're doing something not quite kosher, right? Because you can always rewrite the code to like use some sort of logical operator in such a set of situation. Um, let's go ahead and finish off doing this function. So uh, Haskell is lazy, right? So so I can go ahead and call two digits on the input, even though I haven't, um, even though I haven't put an if statement for this anywhere. Um, you might think that you have to write your code where you say check UPC i, if i is less than or equal to zero, then false else and then you know do some sort of terrible okay now i'm going to bind out the digits in this situation right this is, this is how you would write it in a very imperative situation let me indent this uh so that it looks clearer um and like while this certainly does work it's not necessary because haskell is lazy so if i write my code where i say something like um if i is greater than zero. Well, if i is less than zero, then this will be false. And the and will short circuit, and then I will never make use of digits in whatever the rest of the code I was writing here was. And so I don't have to worry about this situation in this case. So let me just finish. Um, uh, there's a question, which is, can I go over let expressions and their use cases? Um, that's a great question. Um, when I want to use a let expression, um, instead of using a where. So I would typically always use a where when I can, but I can't always do it. In the lab, I don't think there were any cases where I wasn't able to use a um, where. Um, let me check my model solution. Okay, here's an example where I use a let statement. Um, but uh, this is not a great example because I could have used a where in the situation. Um, let me think. So one situation where you might want to use a let statement directly is because um, you did a pattern match and you need to refer to something inside the pattern match. Uh, let me pop out of this file for a moment. Actually, no, I'm not gonna pop out of this file, but let me just stub this out. I'm gonna give a very synthetic example. So let's say that you know I have um, I have some function that uh, given an integer returns a maybe int, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because um, it doesn't matter. And so now I'm writing function that uh, I want to do some computation on the result of the f in question. So I start off I call f on i. I get a maybe int and I want a case over it, right? So this is a, a, a redux of the case statement that we did earlier where we, where we you know, had some call to a function and then we wanted to look at what the results were. So if it's nothing, I want to return false. But if it's just some new integer, let's call it j, then I want to do something to it. So now if I want to define a, you know, a sub function that makes a reference to j, I have to do a let statement. This is not a very good reason to uh, not a good very, very good reason to um, use a let statement, but but let let's just imagine that it was something more complicated. So I have to write the let statement like this because only inside of this expression is J in scope. If I try to do this as a where.
Haskell would complain that J is not in scope. Does that answer the question here? Okay, so I'm just gonna keep plugging along with the example here. Um, I don't know if I answered the original question about if then else, but uh, well, let's just keep doing this. So to check a UPC code, um, I, I need the number to be greater than zero. And there's some more stuff I'm gonna put here that I don't quite know what it's gonna be. So I wanna convert the number into a bunch of digits. And I want to get out the evens and the odds, right? We wrote all these helper. Fun oh, and then I want to I want to pad. I want to pad this to the correct number. And then I need to take out the odd di odd digits from digits. I want to take out the evens. I want to get out the check digit. And um, I probably want to check that the length of the digits is equal to 12, depending on how you went about doing pad zeros. Let's, um, and then so how do I how do I say something is valid UPC code? Well, a, a UPC code is valid if when I sum all the odd digits and multiply it by three, and then if I um, add all the even digits and um, let me just make this full screen. And then what do I do? Well, I want to take the remainder of the result divided by 10. But um, now I need to do an if statement. Maybe this is the if statement that someone was asking. If the remainder is zero, use zero as the check digit. Otherwise, subtract the remainder from 10. So that I probably want to just, you know, uh, make a little temporary var variable to do this. And you can use an if statement here if you want. Um, I'll need parentheses because I'm using ands. So if x is zero, then um, x is the check, uh, zero is the check digit. Else, subtract the remainder from 10. So this is our tentative check digit. And then I can just test if it matches the check digit. And I don't know if I actually did this right. Let's see if I did. Um, I is not in scope. Yeah, because I need an argument. And J is not in scope because that's my example from below. That doesn't work. And I'm just going to go ahead and check what it computes on this. True, that's good. What about this? False, that's good. So assuming I didn't make a, a random problem, maybe this will work. Um, great question in the chat, which is, will quick check uh, work here? And um, the answer is, well, maybe. So it's certainly not true that um, every UPC code is valid, right? Because um, uh, there are plenty of integers that are not valid UPC codes. So if I actually just, and actually we can do this, Test quick check. I ran quick check directly on test UPC. It would tell me, hey, I found an invalid UPC code. One is not a valid UPC code. So that's kind of not so great. 
Um, we can try to make this a little more interesting by like maybe saying, you know, if a UBC code is less than a thousand, then um, we should not have a valid UBC code. And um, that's not true either because it turns out zero is a valid UPC code. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I guess I'll take it from faith from QuickShip, but that's true. Um, but but we can we, we can like set up you know sort of all sorts of interesting conditions to see if we can you know like do this. Oh, 17 is also a valid UPC code. We can basically use QuickCheck to find <laughs> valid UPC codes in this way. So um, so that's very interesting, but it's not a um, it's not a it's not a good test. So to do quick check, there you need to be able to come up with some property that is true for the entire input space. Sometimes this is easy to do. Sometimes this is not so easy to do. Um, for something like UPC codes, it's not so easy to do. But maybe say you have a reference implementation, you might want to check that two implementations do the same thing. Well, you know, check UPC and the other check UPC. You run them and test that the results are equal. That's a good quick check test in this situation. All right, it's 611. Um, we are out of time. Thanks everyone for joining and see you all next time on uh, next week.